Welcome. In today's video, we will discuss coordinate transformations, direction cosines, and the 2D stress wedge. As I like to do whenever appropriate, I'd like to make a side note here on the word transformed, which literally means to change in composition or structure. And here we read in the New International Version of Romans chapter 12, verse 2, which says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let's look at the New Living Translation, which says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God, here's the word again, transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And of course, the only real transformation that we can ever have or hope to have is one that comes from God Almighty, not from ourselves. Of course, we are incapable of transforming ourselves. As one of the prophets had written so properly, even our best works are like dirty rags in front of God. Well, we begin with an idea here. Here's a, let's say, a, 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 a ruler that is divided in inches. So we have a, a foot-long ruler here. And one of the ideas that you may or may not know about is, well, what is the unit here? The unit, I have uh, 12 inches, and it just so happens that the unit that we're looking at is the inch. And so if I were to take 12, which is the full length, and divide it by itself, I'm going to get its unit. And once I have that unit, which is this one inch that I've drawn here, I can find anything at any point. Let's suppose I find something out here. Let's say it's about six and a half roughly. I can take the six and a half number and multiply it by the unit, which is the one inch, and that would give me the 6.5 inches. Now, that seems a little bit silly, but it is useful when we want to talk about the concept of a vector. Suppose you have a vector. Now, what is a vector? A vector is a quantity that has both magnitude and direction. Okay, so the magnitude would be, for example, this number. And the direction is which way it's going to be pointing. Let's suppose we're in a two-dimensional setting here. I may have, let's say, x and y. And let's suppose I have a vector which I'm going to call my radial vector. Let's just call this the R vector. And that little symbol overhead just means that it's a vector. So R has a direction because it's pointing in this direction. And it has a magnitude, namely, its magnitude is however long this is. Okay, so this would be the magnitude and this would be the direction. Now, the idea coming drawing from this example, what we want to do is we want to talk about what is a unit vector. And a unit vector we can find in the radial direction by taking the magnet by taking this vector r and dividing by its magnitude, okay? So, if I wanted to find the unit vector, let's say the unit vector in radial direction, I'm going to call this E hat sub R. Then E hat sub R, I could say is equal to the R vector, which is like this 12 inches divided by the magnitude, okay? So the R vector divided by its magnitude is going to give me 
the unit vector, which is going to have, of course, a magnitude of 1. Let's suppose this is the unit vector. Okay. Now, <coughs> now, I want to say that supposing this radial direction, this is going back to the concept of polar coordinates, suppose we have some angle theta here. Now, I can, therefore, project the, this value onto the x-axis and this value onto the y-axis. And so we now are going to find out what we mean by direction cosines. A direction cosine will be the components of the unit vector. So for example, this amount, by the way, because this is a unit vector, by definition, unit vectors have a magnitude of 1. Okay? Because it's a unit vector, its magnitude is 1, so this is going to be, therefore, 1 times the cosine of theta, and this amount here is going to be 1 times the sine of theta. If I wanted to, I could say that this angle in here is phi, in which, I, in which case I would say that this is 1 times the cosine of phi, where phi and theta are complementary angles in this case. Okay, so now you have a better sense of what we mean by direction cosines, because the direction cosines are going to be the cos of theta and the cos of phi. Okay, so <coughs> I could write this vector in the following format. I could say it's cos of theta, comma, sine of theta. Or I could write this as cos of theta, comma, cos of phi. And those would be, e in either case, th these would be the components of the unit vector, which is the direction cosine. Okay? Now we want to look and see how to transform coordinates. So supposing I have here some x-axis, which is this one out here. I have a y-axis. But supposing I tilt my axes such that I'm tilting by an angle of theta where this is now the x prime axis and this is the y prime axis. And the question is, if I have a point out here, let's say this point has coordinate values of x, y relative to this axis, these axes, and it has a values of x prime, y prime relative to these axes. The question then is, how do I go between these coordinates? So a way to do this is to drop lines as follows. Take the point, and from the point, drop a line which is vertical. Drop a line that is horizontal. Then take a line and draw it parallel to the x prime and y prime axes. Okay, once you have done that, it should be important for you to notice that if we rotated this x prime axis by theta amount, uh, of course, then this axis is also theta. 
Okay, x prime and y prime are orthogonal, they're perpendicular, there's 90 degrees between them. So you can think of this as being a rigid rotation of these axes. And so look at what you have over here. First of all, in this case, you have from here to here, notice that we had in the old coordinates, you have here, um, this amount is x, right? In the old coordinates. That's this value right here. That means that if I were to draw a line from this point parallel to the y prime axis, this amount then, by trigonometry, this amount is going to be x times the cosine of theta. This amount here is going to be x times the sine of theta. Okay, very good. Notice that this angle here is the same theta angle as we did over here. And notice also that this amount here is this distance here is the y, which is this coordinate. Okay, that means that this amount here is the y times the cos of theta. That means that this is going to be the y times the sine of theta. So now look at what we have. If I come down a little bit, look at this. We have from here all the way to there, we have that x prime, which is this coordinate in the tilted axis, is equal to, we have this amount, x cos theta, plus this amount, y sine of theta, and likewise, it should be noted that this amount here, which is equal to the y prime coordinate, which is this guy right here of that point, p prime, is equal to, let's see what that is equal to. It's going to be equal to y cos of theta, which is from this point all the way down to here, less this amount here, minus x sine of theta, okay? So to, to summarize what we just did, we found a way to go between these axes, and it is the following. You have this, x prime is equal to x cos theta plus y sine of theta, and you have y prime is equal to y cos theta minus x sine of theta. It is possible to write this in uh, matrix form. So I could say that we have the x prime, y prime. So this might be your, your primed vector, let's say, is equal to the following. You have a matrix here times the unprimed vector of x and y. And so that means that I'm going to have cosine of theta, sine of theta, that's this and that. Down here, the first component is going to multiply the x, so I'm going to have a minus sine of theta from these two guys. And then the last component is going to be a cos. Okay, so here is a way to go from the unprimed axes into the primed axis. Once you know by how much you rotated the axis by. Very good. Let's move on to 
a little more of this, looking at it in a slightly different way. So here I have what I'm calling a unit circle. Okay, so my unit circle, coming back, now we're going to work with vectors a little bit. So supposing if this is a unit circle, that means that the radius is 1. And it is common to denote the x-directional unit vector as i hat and the y-directional unit vector as j hat. Supposing now that I rotate this i hat j hat by some theta amount. Okay, so this is very similar to what we were just talking about. And now I have two other vectors in these directions. Let's say b1 hat and b2 hat. So, having done that then, I can say, because this is a unit circle, this magnitude here is 1. And because that's 1, this distance in here, is got, it's got to be cosine of theta. This distance in here has to be the sine of theta. Likewise, this distance right in here has to be, if this is theta, then of course this is theta. So, and this is 1. This vector has a magnitude of 1 because this is still a unit vector. So this means that this has to be the sine of theta. And finally, this distance in here has to be the cosine of theta. Having done all of this, I can build a, a transformation little matrix here. So look at what I have. I have here the following. I have b1 hat, which is this vector here, is gotten by going over cos theta in the i hat direction and then going up an amount sine theta in the j hat direction. So I went this amount and then I went this amount okay, to get to this point on the unit circle. The b2 hat vector, which is this one, now I'm going to go minus sine theta in the i hat direction. That means I'm going this way. And then I'm going to rise up an amount cos theta. And so I have a very nice little transformation array because now I can go between the i, i j hat directions to the b1, b2 hat directions or vice versa very easily just looking at this transformation array. We can generalize this. We did what we just talked about. So if I have x and y, I have um, x prime and y prime, and this is some amount theta, which is theta over there. So if I have a radial vector r, and let's just suppose that I want the r prime as it's in the primed direction, this point here is going to have coordinates of x, y, or x prime, y prime, depending on which system you're looking at. So based on what we've talked about so far, I can very easily say to go from the prime, from the unprimed to the primed, I'm going to have the following. I'm going to have cos theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cos theta. Okay, that's this array right over here, times xy, right? This is known as a passive transformation. Since these vectors did not move, but their components changed because the axes were rotated, okay? We can call this the r prime vector. Typically, this is known as the rotation matrix. Let me denote the rotation matrix as T. And this is the R vector. 
So from this transformation array or this table, we can go from between the i hat, j hat, to the b1 hat, b2 hat, or I could do a change of basis going the opposite way in this system, x, y, going into x prime, y prime. And so it's very simple to do once you have that table to go i hat, j hat. I have this. Now let's let's be careful because I'm going from the b1 hat, b2 hat into the i hat, j hat in this case. So we have to look at this array properly. That means if I'm going to wind up with the i hat, I'm going to have cos minus sine of theta and a sine of theta cos of theta multiplying the b1 hat, the b2 hat. Okay? If you're puzzled how that happened, you should not be because remember that matrix multiplication goes row times column. So the first component times this plus the second component times this, well, we're going to get i hat. That means if I'm trying to get i hat, I'm going to go cos of theta times the first component plus minus sine theta times the second to get my i hat. Okay. All right. Well, let's let me say one more thing about this transformation um, matrix here. And incidentally, I wanted to say when you're going in the reverse direction that you have the following. You have x, y is equal to cos theta minus sine theta, sine theta, cos theta times x prime, y prime. So this is now your r vector. This is, we can call this the t prime vector, or matrix, sorry. And this will be our r prime. Notice that the primes go together on the side of the equality. So you have t prime operating on r prime vector. Up here, when you want it to get into the prime uh, sense, finally, you have the unprime together on this side of the equality. You have t and the r vector. Okay. So the last thing let me say about all of this is that, in fact, the rotation is what we would call an orthogonal transformation. So this is orthogonal. And that just means that you need to show that t prime is equal to t transpose or another way of writing that is to say that t times t inverse is equal to t times t transpose which equals the identity matrix and here I've done a little calculation to prove that that is the case so here's the t prime matrix here is the t prime transpose okay and so if you look at t prime and multiplied on t prime transpose you're in fact after you do all of the math you're getting the identity matrix which is i okay it has ones down the main diagonal and zeros everywhere else so t prime and t are orthogonal matrices Okay, now we come to the last topic for today, which is the stress wedge, the 2D stress wedge. And we begin with an idea of a stress patch. 
And you may wonder, where is this stress patch coming from? Here, I have x-axis, y-axis, and then I have, along the x-axis, I have a stress pointed in the x-direction, a stress pointed in the y-direction, and I have some shearing stresses. So these are the normal, what would be called the normal stress. This would be a shearing stress. And you may wonder, where does this come from? An example of where this comes from is, let's say, on an airplane fuselage, where you may have, let's say, this is the patch that we're interested in on the fuselage of the airplane. And on that, if you mount, let's say, certain instruments like strain gauges on the fuselage of the airplane, you can find, let's say, strains. From the strains, you can find values of stresses. and and here's a little example that I won't do in this video, but I will in a future video on titled uh, the Moore Circle on Airplane Fuselage. So check that video out and we'll solve this particular problem. But let me come back to what we're trying to talk about in today's video. So here I have this stress patch. And now what I'm going to do with the stress patch is I'm going to slice it at some angle. Okay. So that's what I mean by doing that. So I've taken a slice at some angle, and when I do that, I get this two-dimensional wedge. Now, you should understand that this wedge has a dimension that comes like this, which I have not drawn, but I hope you keep that in mind. Okay. Before I do this problem, I want to come back to the stress matrix that I had written up here, namely this one. When I take this um, stress patch, excuse me, when I take this stress patch, I can formulate a stress matrix, okay? And that just consists of the normal stress, the shear stress in the off diagonal positions and the other normal stress which is pointed in the y direction. So let's do an eigenvalue analysis on that which if you forgot go to the video that I had produced on eigenvalues and we're going to do something very similar to that. Okay, So here it is. This equation means that the determinant of the stress matrix minus the sigma times the identity matrix, the determinant of that is going to vanish. And so we want to find the eigenvalues, which are the sigmas. Okay, so these, if, if you've forgotten, these would be the, therefore the eigenvalues. All right, so let's go ahead and do this where the stress matrix is given here. And so if I take a sigma, which is my eigenvalues, and then multiply it by the identity matrix. I'm going to get a matrix like this. Okay. And now I'm going to find S minus sigma I. Let's see what that is. This is going to be the following matrix. It's going to be the sigma x minus the sigma. It's going to be the tau xy minus the zero. It's going to be the tau xy minus the zero. And finally, it's going to be the sigma y minus the sigma. So if I take the determinant of this, look at what I get. I have S minus sigma I is equal to the determinant consisting of these elements. 
and we require this to vanish. If you're wondering why this is supposed to vanish, please go back and check my video on eigenvalues. Okay, now we are going to solve for this determinant, so that means I multiply these diagonal terms and subtract the product of these off-diagonal terms. So that means I get the following. I get sigma x minus sigma times sigma y minus sigma minus tau xy times tau xy. That's a tau xy squared. And all of that's zero. So I get, if I expand this out, I get the following. I get sigma x times sigma y minus sigma times sigma x minus sigma times sigma y plus sigma squared minus tau xy squared is zero. Now, notice that I have something that is quadratic in sigma, my eigenvalues. Okay, look at what we get. We have sigma squared, so there's really a one sitting in front of that, minus the sigma x plus sigma y times sigma plus the sigma x times sigma y minus the tau xy squared, and all of this is zero. And it is important to note that this is quadratic such that I have the coefficients a, b, and c of the quadratic formula. If you don't know what I'm talking about there, you can also go to a video that I produced specifically on the quadratic formula. And so we can solve for the eigenvalues straight away. So the eigenvalues are sigma, there's two of them. Again, if you don't know why that, that is, please do check on the quadratic formula video that I produced. I explained that there. So sigma 1, comma 2 is going to be minus b. So it's going to be minus times that minus. It's going to be a plus. Plus or minus the square root of b squared. minus 4 times a times c all over 2 times a. Okay? And if you go to solving this, you find something very important. To save us a little bit of time, I'm going to well, maybe I should do all of the steps or I shouldn't. Let me, let me do one more step in here and then we'll decide about that. Um, I have, of course, sigma x minus sigma. Actually, this should have been a plus, right? So this is sigma x plus sigma y over this two. I'm separating that. Plus or minus. Okay, we expand this in here. We get sigma x squared plus 2 sigma x sigma y plus sigma y squared minus 4 times sigma x sigma y plus 4 times tau x y squared. All of this happens to be the sigma x minus sigma y squared. And of course, all of this is over 2, which is this 2 over there. Okay, so let me do another step. So you get sigma x plus sigma y over 2, plus or minus. You get the square root of sigma x minus sigma y squared plus 4 times tau xy squared all over 2. Right, and then you're going to get sigma x plus sigma y over 2 plus or minus. Now I'm going to bring this 2 under the radical. To do that, it's going to be 2 squared or 4. So I'm going to get the following. I'm going to get 
the radical of sigma x minus sigma y over 2. Now all of this is being squared, so notice how when I square the 2 here, it became a 4, just as I said a second ago. And 4 divided by 4 is just 1, so this is going to be just tau xy squared. It turns out, and I'll explain this a little bit more um, in a second, but this here is the average stress, okay? You're taking those two uh, stresses, sigma x plus sigma y, and dividing by two, we call that the average stress. Plus or minus, it turns out that all of this here we can call capital R, and that stands for radius when we talk about the more circle in a future video. So let me summarize what we just did here is that we said that the eigenvalues sigma 1 comma sigma 2 sigma 1 is going to be sigma av plus r sigma 2 is going to be sigma av minus r these are what are known as the principal stresses and they are of course the eigenvalues of our stress matrix S. Okay, very good. Now, let me continue the discussion as I had intended a second ago. So let me come back here and let's just look at this a little bit more closely. So we want to now look at this stress wedge and notice that I had originally I had a sigma x this way and a sigma y pointing this way and then I had some shear stresses okay tau xy if I do a, um, an, I'm going to do a statical analysis. That means I'm going to look at these in terms of force. So to do that, we need to first define that by definition, a force is equal to the stress times the area. And so now, I have the stresses on this diagram here. I've got these, and what I need to do is figure out what are the respective areas. And so notice that I have in this, as I took a, a slice through the stress patch at some angle theta, that angle theta is this angle right over here. And so normal to that, I'm getting a normal stress sigma x prime and I'm also getting a shear stress, tau x prime y prime, which is this one given in the blue. I also have my um, stress S sub x and S sub y along the x and y directions. Okay, so let's look at, using this definition, let's try and do a force analysis here. So in the horizontal direction, I'm going to find that the area, again, there's this area of this wedge, which is coming out this way. This area is equal to area times S sub X, okay, which is this, this, vec this stress right over here, is equal to, that's going to give me this force, now what other forces do I have in the horizontal direction? So sum of forces in horizontal direction. Okay, on the left I would have this. Then I've got this one over here and I also have this one over there. So let's account for those. I have the stress, which is this one times its area. Now its area is, you can't really see it, but it's this area sitting back here. And this area happens to be A 
which is this area, times the cosine of theta, right? So it's going to be a times cos of theta plus, now I've got this one, tau xy, and you can't see that area, but it's this area. And this area happens to be a times the sine of theta, so it's tau xy times a times the sine of theta. Okay, and that's what I would write into this box here. And I can do now the sum of the forces in the y direction. And if I do that, I'm going to get a similar expression, where these are thetas. And now if I were to divide both sides of these equations by the common area, because A is, exists in these equations throughout in each of the terms, if I strike those out, I get this pair of equations. So now I have an expression for the stress in the x direction sitting on this incline, which is this one. And I also have the stress sitting on this incline pointed vertically, which is S sub y. and here they are respectively. I could write these in matrix form uh, as I've shown in equation A.2 and really there are two equations that are sitting inside of this one. It seems like it's one equation but really you have an expression for S sub X which is that and then you also have an expression for S sub Y which is this. So really there are two equations wrapped up into this matrix form. And if I were to abbreviate this as my S vector, this without the vector symbol above, I'm going to call my stress matrix. And this is what I'm going to call my unit normal vector. And the unit normal vector is nothing other than a vector which is pointing outward from this and it is perpendicular to this plane. And this is the unit normal vector n hat. Okay? And that's this one. Okay? Then we can write all of this a little more compactly in this format. This is a vector. This is a matrix. This is the unit normal vector of inclined plane. Okay, So that inclined plane can be perfectly described by this one unit normal vector. Now the question then becomes, if I want to find the normal and the shearing stresses in the primed directions, then all I have to do based on what we've been talking about is do a transformation and here is my uh, rotation matrix as we had developed earlier and so that's this uh, matrix there and I'm multiplying the SX and the SY again if this was the incline, don't forget that this was SX and this was SY. And now we're interested in something like this in along the X prime and Y prime directions, which is these two guys. It's very important that you understand that the rows of this, this matrix happen to be the direction cosines. Okay? So here is a direction cosine in for the let's say the radial component and here is here are the direction cosines for the tangential direction which is going along 
the y prime which is associated with the shear of course okay so we have shearing going in the y prime direction and we have a normal stress going in along this x prime direction and here they are written out fully now sometimes I may write this as the transpose in which case I go from being a column vector into a row vector so if you ever see the transpose notation you'll understand what we're talking about and so here it is I can say that sigma x coming back from this equation up here sigma x is going to equal the ER transpose operating multiplying the s vector okay and that this is the sigma x prime the tau x prime y prime is similarly the e hat transpose of the theta operate times the s vector substituting the s vector which was this into these equations I get then this is the matrix okay this is so I know this could be a little confusing but we have a vector here and we have a matrix here so please don't mix those up and so I can write my sigma x prime and my tau x prime y prime stresses in that way and here if you continue this multiplication which I'm doing over here you're going to get this pair of equations I can find the y prime stress very simply by subbing in theta plus 90 degrees into my theta argument in for this okay so everywhere where you have a theta if I sub in theta plus 90 degrees remember that sigma x and sigma y are always separated by 90 degrees or sigma x prime and sigma y prime are always separated by 90 degrees that's what we're saying over here and so I can get that equation very simply now we can write all of these equations in an alternate way if we just remember some trigonometry so remember that the sine of a double angle sine of 2 theta is sine of theta plus theta which is equal to sine of theta cos of theta plus cos of theta sine of theta or this is equal to 2 sine of theta cos of theta which is that and similarly we remember that cos of 2 theta let me abbreviate a little bit is equal to cos of theta times cos of theta minus okay when you have cos of theta plus theta which is that the plus becomes a minus so it becomes sine of theta sine of theta or cos squared of theta minus sine squared of theta we also remember that we have that the cos squared of theta is equal to 1 minus sine squared of theta okay so 1 minus sine squared of theta minus the sine squared of theta you're gonna get 1 minus 2 sine squared of theta and now if I look at this and this over here together I can solve for the sine 2 sine squared theta and that'll give me this equation in A13 that says 2 sine squared theta is 1 minus cos of double angle we can also by a similar approach show that 2 times cos squared theta is equal to 1 plus cos of double angle so an, uh, another way of writing 
what we had developed up above, I've just repeated this. This was what we developed up above. When I go ahead, I can, first of all, multiply every term top and bottom by 2 for these normal stresses. So obviously I didn't change anything. However, by writing it plus and minus up above, I am now poised to be able to make these substitutions. For example, 2 cos squared theta is sitting right over here. That's 1 plus cos of 2 theta, which is this one here, plus, of course, the tau xy didn't change of 2 theta, plus now a half, which is this, a half of sigma y, 2 sine squared theta is sitting right over here, and so I can write the 1 minus the cos of 2 theta right over there. And let me come down a page here. I've repeated what we just wrote. We have 1. The 1's didn't come out into this thing, and the thetas have faded out somehow. So if you do, if you put all this together, you're going to get this equation, finally. So this is an alternate way of seeing your sigma x prime alternate way of expressing the stress in the x prime direction. In the tau x prime y prime direction you have this and similarly in the sigma y prime direction you have this. Okay, that brings me to the end of this very lengthy video. I apologize for the length of it, but we did cover some very important things from coordinate um, transformations to direction cosines. Of course, we talked about vectors. We talked about expressing things in matrix form. Then we showed how the stress patch can come up in real life, like on, for example, on the skin of an airplane. And then we showed t if, you were, if you had instrumented the skin of your airplane with, let's say, strain gauges, you can back out the stresses. And then from the stresses, what we're really interested in is trying to figure out what is the stress at any particular angle, theta. So that's what these equations tell us. And in a future video, I'll do a more circle um, development on that airplane fuselage problem that I showed earlier, and we'll actually solve and see precisely what are the maximal stresses that we anticipate uh, happening on that airplane fuselage and at which direction those maximum stresses occur. Again, thank you for your patience, and I hope this uh, development was helpful to you. We'll look forward to seeing you in a future video.